<laughs> okay, thank you. So again, welcome everyone. Um, so it's a pleasure to, to uh, have today Dr. Uh, Alan Berko with us. And um, actually, Dr. Uh, Alan Berko is a pioneer in uh, micro, microbiota research. So she started uh, researching on uh, this topic in 2005 when no one else um, made a connection between microbes, gut microbiota, and uh, our health. So it's really a really pleasure to, to have Dr. Alan Berko today with us. And Dr. Alan Vergoe obtained her bachelor's in biochemistry from the University of London and her PhD in molecular microbiology through an industrial partnership with Public Health England. Emma started her faculty career at the University of Calgary in 2005 with a Fellow to Faculty Transition Award through CHG, AstraZeneca and CIHR to study the normal microbes of the human gut. In particular, she was among the few that focus on trying to culture this uh, unculturable microbes in order to better understand their biology. To do this, she developed a model gut system to emulate uh, the conditions of the human gut and allow com communities of microbes to grow together as they do naturally. Emma moved her lab to University of Guelph in late 2007 and has been a recipient of several Canadian Foundation for Innovation Awards uh, that has allowed her to develop her specialist uh, anaerobic fermentation laboratory farm. This was boosted by the award of a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Human Gut Microbiome Function and Host Interactions, where she focuses on missing microbes from the industrialized microbiome. In 2013, Emma co-founded uh, New Biota, a research spin-off company that aims to create therapeutic ecosystems as biologic drugs on a commercial scale. The research enterprise for this uh, company is also based in Guelph. So welcome, and we are looking to hear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me okay? I don't know if I need a microphone for this. Is that all set up? It's all set up. Okay, brilliant. You can all hear me? Good, I'll try not to mumble. Um, it's really good to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And um, I'm so sorry that it's not January. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not sorry for January, but I'm so sorry that I couldn't come in January. That was uh, beyond my control. And that it uh, happens to be a very busy time of year, and I get that. So I appreciate those sort of being able to uh, spend time looking at this and those who are going to view the video afterwards of the recording. So uh, thank you for that. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so... I didn't really know what to talk about today because I've got a lot of things going on in my lab um, and, and a lot of very kind of disparate things. And so I decided that uh, looking at the uh, profiles of all the people that work in this department, and I thought, OK, I'll pick a couple of, uh, of, of, of stories to tell, uh, which might resonate with some of you. And uh, but um, I think after this, as a meet and greet, I have many, many projects ongoing in the lab and you're welcome to ask me about any of those. Um, and um, and hopefully this will be an interesting talk from that point of view. Um, I'm going to talk about um, basically two things going on in my lab, one involving human milk oligosaccharides and the other one uh, involving uh, missing microbes uh, from the uh, Amazon rainforest, which is uh, kind of a new area that I'm getting involved in. Um, and, uh, and, and fairly incomplete, very preliminary data, but I thought I would uh, share it with you today. <clears throat> so let's start by, um, oh, there we go, uh, by uh, just giving you a bit of um, background for the microbiome. And I think that uh, most of you here probably know this, so I'll breeze through this as uh, um, getting audio. Oh, no. oh. Oh, hang on, it's, okay, <laughs> sorry, this comes up on my screen. Okay, so um, I just want to give you a bit of background on the human gut microbiome and uh, just to sort of orientate you, you don't need to be experts in microbiology, so don't worry. Um, but what you do need to understand is that we are not just humans. And I think that's really been appreciated in the last uh, 20 or so years, um, uh, even more so. Uh, what we are, in fact, are complex superorganisms of human and microbial cells. Uh, and we exist with, the, with these microbes and these microbiome, if you like, um, in a very delicate host microbe equilibrium. And that equilibrium is kind of what I study the most in my lab. Um, and it seems to be uh, more and more uh, becoming very, very important in terms of, of human health. 
so we're realizing that we're, we're kind of eroding our microbes, um, we're damaging them through some of our lifestyle things, and I'll get, I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and that, that could have some major impacts on our health, but we hadn't really realized it because we didn't really appreciate how important the microbes were because we can't see them, so you know, out of sight, out of mind, until, as I say, the last 20 years or so. Now, most of the microbes um, on, our, on our bodies actually reside in our gut. And if our body is a planet, then uh, the colon is the super city of, the, of, the, uh, of, of, of our bodies. It has by far the most microbial diversity and um, abundance in terms of numbers uh, of any other body site uh, present. So I focused on that really just because when I started, no one was focusing on that at all. So that was the easy one to go for. It's also easy to sample because uh, we can sample it using stool as a sort of a uh, rough estimate of what's inside the colon. And so uh, for me starting out, this, this seemed to be a good place to start, even though it's not particularly pleasant or a nice thought, but it uh, worked out well for me. Um, so when we think about our feces, um, so feces contains around 10 to the 11 uh, bacterial cells um, uh, and around 200 different species. And this is uh, bacteria. Now, I'm not, not, I'm not ignoring the other microbes present. There are plenty of other microbes there. There's archaea, there's fungi, there's protists, there's viruses. Um, we're not, I'm not going to talk about those today just because, although we have projects working on them, I don't have time. And, uh, and the bacteria are actually the most numerous cellular life form that you'd find in the code. All right, so how do we study something as complex as the gut microbiota? Well, um, this is just an image actually from a um, project that we did not too long ago for the Nature of Things, which is a documentary series. They asked us to look and see if we could prove that, um, uh, that, that corn, when you eat uh, kernels of corn, that it doesn't get digested by the gut. So, so we did this whole project where we actually dug bits of corn out of the presenter's poop. It was a really <laughs> nasty project uh, from that point of view, but we put it under the electron microscope just to sort of show people that actually that's not true and that it actually does get digested, but the hard part of the kernel kind of doesn't. Um, but we took these really incredible images on that. And so I like to show these because uh, I, I think they showcase a lot of things. First of all, you can see there's many different microbial forms. Uh, you might think of bacteria as kind of boring, uh, sort of bean-shaped cells, that's all you see. But when you look at them like this, you can see that there are many bean-shaped cells, but some of them look more like peanuts, some of them are a bit smaller than others, some of them are long. Um, you can also see a little bit of the interconnectivity uh, between, the, um, uh, between some of the microbes. And I think that's also important to appreciate that these microbes form a community. And these, this community together is interacting with each other. And they are, and they can do this through multiple ways, mostly chemical, but sometimes physically as well, through these appendages that they produce. Um, now, as a complex microbial ecosystem, you, um, the, 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 the function and behavior of this ecosystem is really best studied as a whole. So in other words, if you start taking the microbes out piece by piece and you study them on their own, then you find that they do different things to how that they behave very differently to how they behave. Um, when they are in with their friends. And that's a very important thing. We have to remember that microbes are not just simple nanomachines. They're incredibly efficient and very tuned to their environment. And so they all uh, work together. And uh, an ecosystem is really a synergistic, you know, a, a collection of its, uh, of its parts rather than just um, uh, additive. So when you have microbes in a microbiology lab, they almost always exist on their own as part of a pure culture. Usually they have to adapt to survive that way. And they're often grown logarithmically because we want them to grow fast <laughs> and do experiments with them. And so to do that, we often give them access to rich nutrient sources. We spoil them basically, and they become quite lab adapted quite quickly. And that's a, that can be a problem for lots of other reasons. But when you think about microbes in nature, it's a very different picture. So they almost always exist as part of a microbial community. They benefit from their friends and from their host. They very rarely grow logarithmically when they're in this state. And that's quite an important uh, thing to understand. And they rarely have access to rich nutrient sources. In fact, what they do is they can kind of share the, uh, the limiting nutrients that are available to them. And um, in a true community, they will actually um, uh, sort of uh, less compete and more um, uh, contribute uh, collectively to the breakdown of these substrates. And that's, that's also very important. It makes that ecosystem quite cohesive. So uh, in, when I started out in my lab, 
Um, when back in 2005, when it was very unfashionable to culture microbes, uh, and particularly culturing microbes from, um, from complex ecosystems that were perceived to be unculturable, even that word was used at the time, um, I decided that actually I was going to culture these things. And so what I did is just try to emulate nature. And so it turns out that the human colon is actually just a very sophisticated bioreactor. Um, and you can actually emulate that using bioreactors off the shelf, uh, which is indeed what we did, um, made of glass and stainless steel, so not quite the same, which is a model. Um, but you can use chemostat bioreactors to emulate the conditions of the um, human colonic environment. And when you do that, you can actually um, support an ecosystem from a, fe from a fecal sample that, that becomes very representative of the fecal sample from which it came. And that's very important because we, we can actually start to culture some of these so-called unculturable microbes. We've come a long way since then, and we've been able to culture a lot of these microbes on their own as well, because we've learned how to do it. Um, but uh, but when, when we're trying to understand how they behave, we try to grow them together as part of a community. So the chemostat bioreactor is, um, is really, as I said, just a glass and stainless steel vessel. It's equipped with a pH probe, a temperature probe. There's an impeller here. I don't know if you can see my, yes, you can see my cursor. Uh, there's a gas bubbler and the gas bubbler is there to maintain uh, positive pressure and also to keep oxygen out because a lot of these microbes are very sensitive anaerobes. And uh, that's part of the reason that they were less studied is because you need some very specialist equipment to be able to culture anaerobes. And these are very, some of them are very sensitive anaerobes. You can't have even a whiff of oxygen uh, because they will, um, they will die pretty fast. Um, we have a medium feed coming in and uh, a waste output, and that is matched. The, uh, the timing is matched, so we have a 24-hour retention time. Now, this is very, very basically a, or very es an estimate of the retention time or the transit time across the colon. Now, for different people, it can vary. And so we get that, but we can't, um, uh, we have to sort of pick something and run with it. So we went with 24 hours, um, but we can, of course, change that. Uh, as well in the system. So if we wanted to look at a, what a shorter retention time does, then we can, we can change that very easily. This is what it looks like in the lab. In fact, this is an older version with the old CPU unit. Now we've got some nice touch screens. They're all very nice uh, to use. The actual vessels are sort of housed in, underneath all of this sort of uh, tubing uh, that you can see. They look incredibly complicated. And it's quite funny because when my students come into the lab for the first time, my graduate students, you can see their faces fall because they think, how on earth are we going to run this thing? But very quickly, um, they, they get very used to using it and it is quite an intuitive system. So although it looks complicated, it's not too bad. And when you seed it with fresh feces into this vessel, um, you, the system supports that broad ecosystem for weeks at a time. Uh, it takes actually about a month for that ecosystem to reach what we call an equilibrium or a steady state where we can start to mess with it. Um, otherwise, we're going to see some stochastic effects. And, uh, and it supports not just the bacteria, but also the fungi, the archaea, and the viruses as well. We've seen that. And it's a host-free system. So that can, we can see that as a benefit and also a drawback, of course, um, depending on which way you look at it. But uh, we see it as a benefit because we're trying to understand how the microbial ecosystem behaves in, in um, isolation of the host. So we're just trying to see it's a complicated enough ecosystem without trying to sort of factor in the host, fact the, the, the host part of it. But what we can do is add host factors uh, individually or in groups or whatever to see how they influence the microbial ecosystem. So it's a way to sort of tease apart how this ecosystem is running. And the other great thing about it is that because it's not a living organism, um, vertebrate organism anyway, um, we can do all sorts of nasty things to the chemostat so when it's running and we don't have to ask permission to do it. So although we have to get bioethical approval to take the stool samples, of course we do. Uh, once we have those stool samples and we have the ecosystems up and running, we can do some pretty nasty things to these ecosystems. And we have done. Uh, we've starved them, we've fed them with all sorts of pesticides and uh, chemicals and dietary uh, factors. Um, and, uh, and all sorts of things. And we can do that. We can also sample them very readily because it's there for us to sample. So even in the middle of the night, if we need to sample, we don't have to ask permission, we can just come in and do that. And we can very easily measure metabolic output. So because it's a glass and stainless steel vessel, the, metab the metabolites, especially the small molecule metabolites that would normally be absorbed very fast by a host in situ, um, were, uh, are actually there for the taking, if you like. So we can sample these vessels very easily and in my lab, we tend to use uh, nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR 
uh, proton NMR as a way to look at the, uh, the metabolites. And so, um, so we do that. We have protocols for doing that. It's a very cheap way of doing it um, because we're quite lucky enough to have the equipment there at Guelph. And, um, and it means that we can really profile the, meta the metabolic output of these ecosystems very readily and very quickly as well. So we can add a, um, a perturbation of some kind and we can measure the effects of that perturbation almost in real time, which is, uh, which is great. Now, we can also create model ecosystems, and I'm not going to dwell on this because I'm not talking too much about it now, but, but something that we've been doing uh, since, you know, since the beginning is trying to create microbial ecosystem libraries so that we can recreate microbial ecosystems and have them as um, reproducible <laughs> elements. So one thing we have to uh, understand is that if you run the chemostat vessel under the exact same conditions with the exact same microbes, even if you put the microbes in in slightly different ratios to start with, the ecosystem sort of finds its own feet and you end up with a very um, uh, uh, straightforward, very um, reproducible ecosystem at the end that, that looks almost identical uh, to each other. And this is what makes it such a useful system because it's extremely difficult to do that with actual people. <laughs> uh, and so it's nice to have a reproducible system uh, so you can check your experimental results and make sure that what you're doing is actually real. Um, now, it's not, easy, not always easy to get poop, fresh poop for experiments, and uh, although we sample the student body at Guelph quite often, it takes a special sort of person to, uh, <laughs> to, to donate, and uh, sometimes I find that people would rather give a kidney than, uh, than a stool sample. Um, but so what we've done is, is try to create libraries of these ecosystems so we don't have to keep asking donors. And so um, it, it can actually be a lot more reproducible to do that. So to do that, what we do is we take a fecal sample, we'll dilute it and plate it. This is just basic old fashioned microbiology. Um, we're very good at this in our lab and we have the facilities to do this in anaerobic chambers and uh, chambers with um, different oxygen um, concentrations. <laughs> Um, and uh, we've tried many different media types over the years. We isolate the microbes, we identify them, and we curate them and cryopreserve them. So nothing new there or exciting. Um, but the other thing that we do that really increases the numbers of microbes that we can get out of a store sample is we take that same fecal sample um, and also we, we can put these microbes into a robogut to make an ecosystem, but we can take that same fecal sample and we can put that into the robogut, grow that to steady state. And what you'll find is that some of the microbes that are present in the stool in very small numbers will actually come up in numbers and we can start to isolate them. And, um, and those kinds of things are very, uh, the, the very low abundance rare taxa uh, can be very, very difficult to get to otherwise. So this is a way of doing that. And then we can also um, obviously go back around to do this isolation. And we've improved on this in recent times because we've now added a fax to this so that we can actually go in and try to predict out the membrane proteins on target um, microbes that we're, that we're after, if we have their genomes. We can raise antibodies to the peptide antigens, the predicted antigens, um, and we can then use a fax to try to sort them or enrich for them, or even just magnets um, and magnetic bees. We can do that as well, we have done. And so, um, so we, can, we can create very complex ecosystems. And in fact, our model ecosystems that we, that we create aren't simple. Some of them have more than 100 different strains. In fact, the, the, uh, the leading one that we have right now is 138 different um, bacterial strains. And that's a lot of strains. It's actually quite, very, quite difficult to uh, put together. We have ways of doing that too, which I won't have time to get into. And the other thing that I just want to bring up before I move on is, is that the RoboGut isn't just for the human gut. So because I'm at Guelph, of course, I'm surrounded by lots of people who work with animals and who are very interested in uh, animal guts. And so as well as the human gut, we've also got the model system to look at the mouse cecum. And that's important because we're interested in how um, lab animals uh, from, um, can um, emulate the human gut. Um, as well, we looked at the pig colon, we've looked at the horse colon recently, we published that. Uh, we're currently doing some work looking at the salmon distal gut. And um, most recently of all, and something that I'd love to talk about today, but I don't have time, is something that I'm doing, which is really out of my kind of field of expertise, but I'm having an awful lot of fun, is working with the uh, honeybee distal gut. So this is taking an insect gut. Uh, we call it the Roby gut, of course, so, you know, we have to give it a funny name. Um, and my postdoc is the one uh, who's sort of set this up, but we can now emulate the honeybee uh, distal gut with an ecosystem. This is about 200 mils of um, vessel um, content, uh, which is a lot more than you get in a single bee. So now we can take that and we can profile how microbial ecos, how this microbial ecosystem reacts to all sorts of pesticides, 
herbicides, fungicides, and many, many other things that, that we're trying to do, as well as creating a library of healthy, healthy uh, bee gut um, associated microbes. So I'm going to tell you two stories from my lab. As I said, um, the first one is about human milk oligosaccharides, and the second one is about um, the missing microbes from the Amazon jungle. So let's start with the first one. Uh, microbes and ecosystems and their responses to these human milk oligosaccharides. So first of all, for those that don't know, what are human, oligo human milk oligosaccharides, or HMOs, as I'll call them from now on? Uh, so these are components of breast milk, which are fascinating to me because they are very complex sugar structures that cannot be processed or broken down by mammalian um, uh, digestive systems. So they have to be there for some reason, otherwise why would they be there? And so the idea here is that uh, they are food for microbes and particularly for gut microbes and for getting those microbes established in the gut from an early age. So you can see here in the left, this image is just showing you the uh, percentage of human milk that is um, uh, made up of human milk oligosaccharides. And human milk oligosaccharides themselves are, there's around about, um, I think 240 different uh, that have been uh, figured out so far, incredibly different um, structures to them um, with all sorts of side chains and uh, some of them are silated and some of them are not. And, and it's a very, very complicated um, uh, sugar chemistry and I'm not a chemist, so I'm not gonna get into that. Um, but so the point that I'm trying to get across is that there are many, many different types. Now you may have heard of one of them, because Nestle and other um, uh, makers of uh, formula milk have started to incorporate human milk oligosaccharides into their formula milk products because they're realizing that these are probably quite important for the development of the human gut microbiome. But if you actually look at what they're doing, uh, they'll talk about they're using HMOs and you can see HMO in big letters here. But if you look very, very small letters just above it, it says 2FL. And that is the only human milk oligosaccharide that they are generally putting into these uh, formula um, uh, these formula um, recipes. And that is because most of these human milk oligosaccharides are incredibly difficult to make, uh, to synthesize. And so generally speaking, you have to isolate them or uh, purify them, if you like, from human milk itself. And that can be extremely expensive. Obviously, that's not commercially viable. Uh, so they're only adding 2FL. A couple of um, newer ones have got, I think, two other structures that they can easily make, but they tend to be the easy um, uh, structures, the, the more simple structures that they're adding to these, these milk products. So we were very interested in this, and um, so I was very lucky uh, that I had a fabulous PhD student in my lab. She uh, defended her thesis last year, and she's now working at UC San Diego. And she was... Part, she was um, uh, funded by CHR to, uh, to look at uh, asking, answering the question of how do HMOs modify the microbiome, or the gut microbiome in particular. And we did this as part of a larger project called the Diabimmune Microbiome Project. Um, and this is um, run through a collaborator of mine at SickKids, Dr. Jane Danska. And what we're interested in here is looking at this cohort of children who have um, uh, very well-defined HLA haplotypes that um, predispose them to the development of type 1 diabetes. Now, just having that predisposition doesn't mean that you're going to develop type 1 diabetes. About 7% of children do who have these HLA, HLA haplotypes. And the question for this cohort was a bigger question, not to, really to do with the microbiome, but it's a bigger question of what are the factors that actually give rise to the development of type 1 diabetes in these children. So they, they um, recruited these children at birth, and then followed them through their early childhood and took an awful lot of information about their sort of diets and their um, and, and sort of monitored their um, their lifestyle as well as their, their, their seroconversion uh, over time. And seroconversion is how we understand that uh, the development of type one uh, diabetes can be can be measured as sort of a biomarker. So we're looking for seroconversion or the development of autoantibodies towards the pancreatic pilot cells. So as a subset of this um, project, what, uh, what was very interesting, I mean, this project started quite a while ago now, uh, but right at the beginning, the, the, the kids that were sampled, they took very small poop samples for each of them. Now, the, these poop samples were not taken for a microbiome idea at the time. They were just sort of taken because they figured that they could be useful for something. 
and boy were they useful. <laughs> so we were able to take these um, some of these uh, samples, and of course you have to apply to the cohort, it's not just taking samples, they're very precious samples, and we were able to get some samples from four controls and three cases. One of the controls was a sort of a, a, a sort of a pilot study that we did because we had no idea how these samples had been in the freezer for you know twenty or so years, and and um, some of them and uh, could have been uh, pretty degraded, so we didn't even know we'd be able to culture anything from them. But we thought we'd give it a try, and we were very successful with that. And so we went ahead and uh, and continued with other uh, with six other uh, samples that we were able to get. Now these. Um, Individuals are uh, age, sex, and HLA haplotype matched in pairs. Uh, and so that's just a sort of a, a table um, indicating that. Now, what we're quite interested in is the duration of breastfeeding because, and that's how the HMO part came to being because there's an idea and says that's supported by the literature that suggests that somehow the uh, breastfeeding for a long period of time protects against the development of type 1 diabetes in these individuals who have an HLA haplotype that predisposes them to type 1 diabetes. Um, so our aim then was to investigate the impact of the human milk oligosaccharides on type 1 diabetes gut-derived microbiota. So what Simone did was she took these stool samples uh, and remember, these are tiny, less than one gram. That's one of the great things that the RoboGut can do for us is really amplify these ecosystems so that we have large volumes to work with. So we put them in the, bi in the bioreactors, and then in smaller volumes, um, she harvested the microbiome, and in the anaerobe chamber, she was able to uh, expose these uh, ecosystems once they'd reached steady state, either to no treatment as a control or to 2FL, remembering, again, that 2FL is the... <laughs> To, is the human milk oligosaccharide that most uh, people have been putting into um, formula milk, or to what we say we call PHMOs, which are pooled HMOs, which have come from human uh, breast milk from our collaborator, Lars Boat at UC San Diego. And then we did this under anaerobic batch fermentation conditions in small volumes because these, these uh, sugars are quite expensive. And so we didn't want to do that in 200 mil volumes. That would have taken a long time. So we did it in batch fermentation, and under batch fermentation, these ecosystems are stable for about 48 hours. Now, as well as that, Simone took 330 uh, bacterial isolates. Uh, she isolated them uh, from uh, around about 150 species, probably more than that, actually. So we have an entire library of strains as well that have come from these infants. And so uh, this is a sort of, uh, what I was trying to say, this is another thing that, that we do, is we tend to collect these large um, uh, libraries of isolates, because there's a lot you can do with isolates as well, even building them back into ecosystems. And then what she did is some HMO glycoprofiling uh, with the uh, Bode lab um, and looking at the HMO structure preferences of all the individual microbes, as well as the ecosystems themselves. Some metabonomics using um, uh, uh, one-dimensional proton NMR, as I mentioned, to look at the metabolites produced by the communities. And then also metataxonomics, and metaproteomics. Now, I'm not going to talk about the last two just for time. And I'm just going to focus on the first two just to show you some of the data that we get. So this is a horribly complicated figure, and I know that, so I hate to put it up, but I wanted to do it because I am hoping that you'll take two things away, uh, at least two things away from, from looking at this. Now, just to orientate you, if you can see my cursor. So for each set here, these are the seven different individuals that we profile, the seven different ecosystems. And um, in the blue is the pooled HMOs, in the, in, uh, is, the, is the ecosystems exposed to pooled HMOs. In the red is the ecosystems exposed to 2FL. And in the green is the control no treatment, okay? And so for each different uh, set, there's a different, so uh, this is just basically looking at um, a subset of the molecules that we were able to profile. And the two things I want you to take away is, first of all, if you look within a set, and so let me just orientate you here. There we go. These are the short chain fatty acids that everyone is very interested about when we're talking about uh, gut, my, uh, gut, gut microbial metabolites. Uh, these are acetate, butyrate, and propionate. They are the most um, uh, prevalent ones. And hopefully what you'll see is for all of these things, um, <clears throat> each different ecosystem is, is doing something different and creating different uh, amounts uh, and types of uh, some of these metabolites. And the other thing that I want you to take away, hopefully, <laughs> is that if you've, if you've got a good eyesight, you can see that uh, very often the blue line looks quite different from the red and green line in for each, for each profiled individual. 
Okay, what does this mean? So basically, it's meaning that there isn't a lot of difference between 2FL treated ecosystems and the control compared to what happens with the pooled human oligosaccharides. It's not good news for formula. <laughs> Okay, so just to show that in a slightly different way, uh, just some um, some scores plots. So some PC um, PCOA uh, scores plots. So you can see that uh, after seventy two hours, you get clustering away with the pulled HMOs uh, away from that control in two FL, and you can also see that uh, in this heat map here, you can sort of see that this blue here, which is the pulled HMOs, they cluster or the profiles. Uh, cluster quite distinctly away from the, the rest of the samples. And so, um, so that's a really interesting finding. Now, we also looked at the effect of the pools human milk oligosaccharides on individual bacterial isolates. I told you we were able to isolate 330 different isolates spanning these seven donors. And when we do that, what we do is we just do simple growth curves in an ecosystem, in, in, a, um, in, a, in an arrow chamber, and when we do that, I'm sorry, another horribly complicated slide, but I'll walk you through it again. Uh, we see all sorts of, um, of growth patterns and uh, microbiologists love to look at these kinds of growth patterns. And so um, uh, pardon me for, uh, for sharing some of these, but I think they're quite interesting. So first of all, in the green, you can sort of see these are the kind of classic uh, curves that you would get that show that the human guts um, uh, uh, or that the, the particular microbes that that, uh, that we profiled here were able to use these human milk oligosaccharides pretty well. Uh, you can see that uh, for the most part in the pink, the light pink, that's the PHMO treatment versus no treatment. We didn't do 2FL for these, so we just have the two. Uh, you can see that these, these uh, microbes are, are very able to utilize uh, these PHMOs. And uh, Bifidobacterium breve is an example. Bifidobacterium, generally speaking, Bifidobacteria are very, very good at breaking down uh, human milk oligosaccharides. But as well as that, we see uh, this interesting kind of dioxic growth. And what's happening here is that we have, and we've got lots of examples of these, I just picked a few. Uh, but uh, what's happening here is that we have uh, microbes that are uh, utilizing one human milk oligosaccharide from the pool preferentially. And then uh, using all that up and then switching on genes to enable them to use another HMO and so forth. And so we have these sort of dioxic growth patterns. In some cases, we have trioxic growth, but they weren't as pretty, so I'm not showing those. And then finally, we have this, which is also really interesting. So this is kind of the opposite. So for these microbes, you get good growth in the uh, control state. And in the, we're not testing human milk oligosaccharides as uh, as, as sole carbon sources here. So we're actually just adding them to, um, to a sugar, a sort of low sugar background to make sure, because these are complex sugars, we're asking a lot for these microbes to break them down. Uh, but what we see is that uh, in these cases, the no treatment control, they, they're growing pretty well into those conditions. But as soon as you add the human milk oligosaccharides, that retards their growth. And we're trying to figure this out right now, because this is a really interesting phenotype It's showing that these uh, particular microbes, their growth is retarded by human milk oligosaccharides. And if you think about that collectively, you can kind of see how the presence of human milk oligosaccharides might help to select or deselect the certain microbes that, that the uh, infant uh, comes into contact with to kind of shape the gut microbial ecosystem. So these are really interesting questions that we're following up with, like how is this happening is one, and, uh, and, and, and what exactly, we don't have time to talk about it, but how exactly these microbes might be involved in the, um, uh, in the genesis, if you like, of, of, of uh, type 1 diabetes. We did a little bit of like a profiling, and this is just to show you um, the darker the color is the, uh, is the, or the, the, the redder the color, I should say, uh, the more of a particular uh, human milk oligosaccharide is being used up. And so you can see that uh, some microbes are very good at utilizing 2FL, probably because it's one of the simplest sugars in the mix. Uh, and then others uh, seem to have patterns that, uh, that reflect um, different, uh, different usage. You'll see some blue here. This just means that um, one of the human milk oligosaccharides is actually being um, changed into another uh, oligosaccharide, which then comes up in, in, in value. I wanted to just point out a couple of things. So these are um, uh, just to show you that sometimes you can have different strains of the same species, so in this case, Acomansium cinephila, that do very similar things to these, uh, to these human milk oligosaccharides. But sometimes you can have uh, strains which do very different things. 
And this is a very important point, is that when we think about gut microbes and we think about gut microbial ecosystems, we tend to think of things in terms of species, when in fact we should be thinking of them in terms of strains, because you can have two strains of the same species that can do very different things. And so from that point of view, depending on which one you've been colonized with, it will have very, very important um, uh, connotations for your health. We also looked at strain behavior in communities versus monocultures. So remembering we've done this sort of monoculture stuff, uh, we took the same strains and we looked at how they behaved in monoculture as well as how they behaved within a community. And uh, without going into too much detail of how we did that, uh, you can see that this particular um, uh, Akkermansia strain uh, seems to be uh, promoted in its growth by human oligosaccharides, both when it's in a community as well as when it's on its own. And if you contrast that to this, you see something quite different. Here's a strain that on its own is, is very able to use um, human milk oligosaccharides, uh, but within a community, it is not, it's being outcompeted. And so that's also very important and goes back to what I was saying about communities and the way that they behave together are very, very important. It's not just about the single strains. So just to summarize this part of the talk, so human milk oligosaccharides significantly alter the metabolic profile of microbial communities. The communities treated with 2FL didn't significantly differ from controls. I said bad news for the, for the formula milk uh, uh, manufacturers. And a wider, a much wider variety of bacterial strains are able to degrade HMOs than was previously known, only because no one was looking. Everyone was looking at uh, the lactobacillus and the bifida bacteria. Uh, but a lot of mi microbes are actually able to use PHMOs. And some strains demonstrate different growth properties when treated in monocultures compared to microbial communities. All right, so switching tags, and this is quite a big switch of attack, so uh, let's clear your mind for a second. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk now about hunting for missing microbes in the Amazon jungle. All right, so. Uh, one of the things that I've been very interested in, and this is actually the uh, area of research on which my Canada Research Chair is involved, is the idea that the industrialized microbiome, the diversity that we have in our microbiomes here in the industrialized world is being eroded. And there is a hypothesis about this that every paper that I've looked at that has examined this has been proving it. Uh, so I believe that this is correct. Uh, and this is a hypothesis from um, uh, Stan Falco and Marty Blazer and uh, they published in 2009, that they basically said that a loss of microbiota, uh, so the loss of species, if you like, generally compounds over generations and recent changes in lifestyle really accelerated that and exacerbated the loss. And so that includes things like sitting on the couch for and eating bad junk food, all these kinds of things that we do in the industrialized world, not everyone, but many of us do, uh, taking prescription drugs because none of those prescri prescription drugs have, have um, and other drugs as well have ever really been tested for their effects in the gut microbiome. And many of them in fact have major effects on the gut microbiome that we're only just beginning to realize. And this graph here on the, on the left is just uh, from that paper, from that um, original hypothesis is just showing that over generational time, and that's on the x-axis here, so each, um, each uh, 20 years is considered to be a generation, um, there's a, um, a, a loss of microbes, a compounding loss of microbes. And whereas you get some potential horizontal acquisition of microbes from the environment that might offset that, that isn't happening fast enough. Uh, and in general, what's happening over time is that you get a net loss of, of uh, microbial diversity. So how do we know that industrialized people have low gut microbial diversity? We only started looking at this you know, 20 years ago ourselves. Uh, so we can't actually go back in time very easily to look at microbiomes before the time of antibiotics and uh, refined foods. But what we can do is we can look at indigenous peoples who have never had exposure to these things. And their gut microbiomes, it turns out, are extremely uh, more diverse than ours. And the classic um, uh, populations that have been studied so far are the Hadza people in Tanzania and the Tuna, Tunapuka people in Peru. So the typical findings um, are that, um, and this is similar across traditional populations in Africa and South America, so geographically very well separated populations, but we see very similar things. We see that uh, in the Western microbiome, uh, we see uh, a general loss of diversity. And in the traditional microbiome, we see a different kind of abundance profile for some of the major phyla, 
and I apologize, these phylum names have recently changed, but I haven't changed the slide because it gets very complicated otherwise. Um, but what you do notice is that there are certain species or certain uh, phyla in particular, uh, which we only find in traditional peoples and never find in the industrialized world. And this suggests that in the, um, the, the Western microbiome has overall lost these species. Uh, rather than the traditional microbiome as overall gain them, because if, if that was the case, then we wouldn't see similarities across such vast geographic distances. So when we started to look at this, um, we sort of thought, well, why can't we just culture? We're very good at culturing, remember, in my lab, so we should just go culture some microbes from these indigenous people. Well, that, it turns out, is extremely difficult to do. We could, if we did this, we could understand what we're missing, but because of many factors, it makes it very, very difficult to do. So, for example, remoteness, difficult access, uh, dangerous terrain, endemic diseases, uh, there's culture and language barriers, political turmoil, ethical challenges. That's a really big one. That's something that we're really involved in trying to understand how we can do this uh, ethically and in the best way. And also, how do we preserve these samples? How do we get them from often very hot parts of the world uh, and uh, from remote parts of the world? And how do we preserve them and get them out of uh, wherever they are to a lab where we can study them properly? So I'm really, very, really very lucky that I have a very individual, a very um, unique individual working in my lab, a PhD student by the name of David Good. Now, David Good is a biologist. Um, he's uh, doing his PhD with me, as I said. Uh, but he has a unique family heritage. His father was a, um, a Yanomami, and Yanomami are a population of indigenous South American uh, people um, in, who mostly live in a very small area, just in there, and you can see in green, in the Amazon jungle straddling the border uh, between uh, Brazil and Venezuela. And David Good's father is an anthropologist who spent 12 years. He went down to the Amazon and he studied the Anamami for six months and he stayed for 12 years. And without going too much into his story, he met and fell in love with the Anamami woman and brought her back to the United States. It's a very uh, kind of interesting story. Again, don't have time to go into it too much. If you're interested in it, David has written a book about his unique family um, uh, sort of history, and uh, that's there. Uh, his father has also written a book uh, but David, it turns out, is a half Yanomami man. He has Venezuelan um, citizenship, and he also has the ability, uh, which is really fairly unique in the world, to be able to sample uh, some sample his family members because there are a lot of ethical um, constraints and political reasons why that becomes very difficult to do otherwise. So David founded the uh, Good Project, a nonprofit organization, uh, which is dedicated to help support the future of the Yanomami people. And it was through David that we were able to get some of these samples out of the jungle. So here's some pictures of David from his collection. Uh, when he goes to visit his family, these are not quick visits for a weekend. He goes for uh, a few months at a time and he immerses himself in the culture there. Um, and he spends um, you know, a, good, a good amount of time with his family. Now this gets over a few of the problems. The remoteness and difficult access, David is an extremely seasoned um, expeditioner, so he goes there regularly and he understands all the difficulty and the, the problems, and he has a whole team uh, who go with him. The culture and language barriers are lessened. Uh, David is an American and he's very much uh, you know, brought up in the US, but he understands the Anamami language and he understands the Anamami culture in a very unique way. It's a very, very unusual culture. So there are some ethical challenges. We have all the right permits to be able to do this because David is a member of the Anamami people, uh, for one thing, and um, we're working now with the uh, Brazilian uh, teams as well because the Anamami are a, sort of a very extended family. Everyone knows everyone. Um, and so uh, even David has family in uh, Brazil. And then preservation of samples, we are able to do that because David has set up what we call the Jungle Lab, which is a set of, uh, uh, of uh, solar-powered, um, uh, lab equipment, including a freezer that we can take down uh, down there, set it up, and so you can take samples and collect them and bring them back out of the jungle. It's not an easy feat. I don't want to minimize the effort that David goes into, uh, but we have been able to get samples out of the jungle. We cannot get over, unfortunately, the political turmoil. Venezuela is a failed state. It's a real problem. And the dangerous terrain endemic disease. And, David often comes back with malaria, despite the fact that he takes prophylactics. And so it's, a, uh, it's something that, uh, that he is taking a risk. 
So what, uh, what does he do? He goes to the jungle, he acts like the crazy uncle, and he asks his family to put for poop samples, which is, and they think that he's just mad, uh, but they're quite happy to give it to him. Um, he takes his poop samples, we put them into anaerobic packs to keep them anaerobic, we put them into a cool box that's solar powered, uh, solar powered to keep it cold, and then he literally treks it out of the jungle, and then on a boat, and then in a car, and on a plane, and then on another plane, and eventually it makes it to the freezer at the University of Guelph. It's a very long process. And these samples that I have in my freezer are among the most precious things that I, that I have. And then we do isolations. So we've done a lot of isolations using a lot of specialist media and lots of tricks I don't have time to go into today, but if you're interested, I'm happy to share. This is Sarah Van Curen in my lab. She's now my technician. Uh, she started off as my master's student and she was just, she has the best green fingers for microbiology that I've ever seen in a student. And so she stayed on to just do this kind of work. Um, and then we took a look at the metagenomics of the samples to see uh, what we could, what we should find. Um, and uh, this is just the bacterial uh, set. We've also got sets for the other types of micros present, but I'm just showing you those. What you see here on the left, this is a typical Westerner, and these are the nine Yanomami samples that we brought out. So you can see that they're quite different and that they contain uh, types of some types of, um, uh, uh, of, of phyla that we don't often see in, uh, in the Western world. Um, and as you might expect, and as we were expecting, the Anamami gut microbiome was far more diverse. Uh, and so this gave us a, a snapshot, but we weren't entirely sure whether the samples that we've been able to get out of the jungle will still contain live microbes. But they did, and it was quite amazing. Uh, so far, we've been able to take from five samples, we've take this, taken this very seriously and took a long time, uh, a yield of around 1,000 unique strains, 200 unique species, um, and uh, for comparison, the only other study that had been done when we started this was in 2015, where they only found 27 unique samples or species from 12 fecal samples using seven media types. So we really have expanded that. Uh, we did find a novel species of treponema from the human gut. Um, these, are the, these are the types of uh, spirochetes that we only usually find in hunter-gatherer people from around the globe, but never looking at DNA samples, as you can see by this sort of solid black box here. We've never seen reads from, um, from uh, people in the USA, for example, in this area. Um, and they are getting more and more, um, these are the ones in, in orange here. They are very rare, uh, even in the hearts of people, um, uh, although there's, uh, there's a lot more of them than there are in other, uh, in other individuals. Now, in some of our Yanomami samples, there are enormous numbers of these treponemes and we've actually been able to isolate them. And this is our famous, uh, or soon to be famous, because we're hoping publishing this this year, what we call the pretzel photo. You can see this sort of, uh, uh, this um, treponeme has folded itself into a pretzel shape, which I think is, is rather cool. Uh, but these treponemes are very, very tiny and they do form these sort of like um, what we call a cystic form. They kind of fold up on themselves as soon as they uh, get a whiff of oxygen, which we think is uh, another interesting thing I don't have time to talk about. So what can we do with these things? Now back to the robo guts. Because we have a model system where we can look at whole ecosystems, we can actually try to understand how diet can affect these microbial ecosystems. So first of all, can we improve the industrial world gut microbiome with the animal diet? So what we did is we compared a healthy industrialized microbiome um, that's uh, just from a healthy donor uh, that was grown under two different diets. Now we use a healthy Western microbiome diet here. We're not trying to emulate a bad diet full of processed food. We actually are emulating a nice, healthy, uh, vegetarian, mostly uh, diet. And we compared it to what the animami eats and they eat a lot more fiber. So this is a lot, more, a lot higher in fiber and the different types of uh, protein sources as well. And so we just uh, thought we would we can compare. This is very preliminary data, as I said, we're just sort of getting going with this now. We were interested to know, are these industrialized world microbiomes truly missing these microbes or are they just present at undetectable levels? So what you can see here is that uh, under a traditional diet and a Western style diet, um, you can kind of see this as one, this is our industrial uh, Western healthy microbiome, uh, just one of them so far. Uh, grown under two different diets. And you can sort of see with this Chow one uh, diversity index, there's not a lot of difference between the two. Uh, both
two different uh, dietary conditions. You can see that the tested Yanomami diet medium is much more supportive for the Yanomami ecosystem than the industrial diet. As, as I said, very preliminary data. We have a lot more of these to do. And, and uh, getting that diet right was, was uh, the Yanomami diet right was, was one of the hardest things that, in fact, that we had to do. And we're not quite there yet. Um, so have we found our missing microbes? So just a couple more slides. Um, so I'm, I'm collaborating with Alex Kostick, who's a, a colleague of mine at Harvard. Um, a few years ago, he published a paper where he was looking at what was what is known as paleofeces, or basically these are fossilized poop samples from about 2,000 years ago that were found in, in uh, caves in, uh, in the southern US and Mexico. And he was able to take the, uh, extract the ancient DNA from these to look at the microbiome profiles of these paleofeces using new algorithms to be able to sort of look at this very damaged DNA. And when you do that, you see something quite, um, maybe what you would expect. This is just a presence absence map. Um, heat map you can see from these industrial microbiomes, this metagenomic, um, uh, or this uh, presence absence map. Uh, and these are the species down here. You don't necessarily need to know what they are. I know you probably can't read them, but you can kind of see, hopefully, that these are the industrial type microbiomes, and these are the non-industrial. These are sort of like um, uh, rural um, uh, populations around the globe who've had um, a lot less exposure to uh, modern lifestyle uh, interventions than in the industrial West. And you can see that those populations, just by looking at them, actually look very different to each other. And on the left here, you can see these, uh, this little bar here, these are the paleofeces samples that they took. So you can see that these paleofeces profiles look a lot more like the non-industrial microbiome than they do the industrial microbiome. This is kind of what you might expect. So what we decided to do then, once we had our samples, sorry, I should have put that there, uh, is we decided that we would add to that data set our, um, like our Yanomami uh, uh, metagenome uh, ecosystems. And when we did that, we decided, because it was a very complicated thing to look at, that perhaps one of the most important things looking at the carbohydrate active enzymes uh, or the genes of the carbohydrate, car carbohydrate active enzymes that are present in these metagenomes. And when we do that, again, you can see here are the industrial type of uh, carbohydrate active microbiomes. It's the same data set as the, for the last figure, uh, just a, it's, it's a slightly different analysis. Here, uh, we can see the non-industrial, and then to the left here, this is the paleofeces as well as the Yanomami. Now, I know you can't see that very well, so I've blown it up for the next one. If you compare the paleofeces to the Yanomami casein profiles, you can see that they are extremely similar to each other. So we really think that what we've found is that the Yanomami ecosystems are representing a microbiome time capsule, and that culture and study of these really enigmatic ecosystems might reveal what functionality we've lost and what we've gained through industrialization. So David, is, uh, his project, his PhD project, is basically trying to understand how these microbes are, or what, they, what these missing microbes need in order to survive, and what happens when you put them back into the Western microbiome um, in a control system like a bioreactor system. So what's next? Um, as I said, these robogut experiments as well as careful characterization of novel species, the genomes and the physiology, because some of these are very novel and uh, they're very, really exciting genomes full of incredible things, which could be very helpful to us. Uh, we're also looking at some of the meta metabolic um, outputs from these um, ecosystems that could have very important health connotations. Um, and then sequencing of the samples in situ. So David is, has a, um, um, an expedition planned for September, coming up in September to this time to Brazil. Uh, he hopes to become the first person to sequence fecal microbiomes directly in the Amazon jungle off the grid using a nanopore. And so we're setting that up in our jungle lab right now so that we can really see whether or not we are changing these microbiome profiles by shipping them out of the, uh, the jungle as we have to uh, in the way that we do. So just to summarize that, there's far more diversity of bacterial species in the Yanomami gut microbiomes than those of typical healthy Westerners, which is kind of what you might expect. We have cultured many novel species and we're in the process of characterizing them now. Uh, the Yanomami ecosystems might represent a time capsule. And we, can we use these ecosystems to better understand the roles of missing, micro, missing microbes in health? 
And that is all I wanted to say. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge my amazing lab. This is us in front of the science complex in Guelph, uh, just as the weather turned nasty last uh, winter. Um, I'd like to thank the collaborators who were involved in this project as well. And, um, and I mentioned as well, Simone, she's left my lab, but she's definitely uh, still there in spirit. And thank you to all the people that have funded me and thank you very much for your attention. Now, the floor is open to questions <laughs> in person and Zoom. Um, I have a great talk. Um, really exciting data. I have a, a couple of questions. Um, one is kind of more general. For the host free system in your robot gut, um, what kind of host features can you add? You mentioned that you can add. Mm -hmm. Just like what types? Of sure, sure. Well, the most major one that we have to, we have to add, because if we don't, then the ecosystem breaks down is mucin. So mucin turns out to be a really, really important part of the gut microbial ecosystem. And um, even when we're modeling like uh, starvation, <laughs> excuse me, mucin is the only thing keeping that ecosystem alive, if you like, from providing some uh, host-like cancer. And uh, so mucin is very important. And if we take away mucin, the whole ecosystem collapses. We can also add secretory IgA, for example, we've done that. Uh, we were adding things like beta defensins right now because we're interested in how those uh, influence the gut microbiome. Excuse me. And, and you know, anything really, when people say, hey, I want to add this, that, and the other, the only limiting factor is cost, right? So something like human milk oligosaccharides, for example, we can't dump those into the bioreactor itself. Excuse me, Rachel, I'm sorry. Uh, because that's really expensive, right? So um, we can grab an apple juice or something that we give. So we have water. So juice, yeah. This is water. Yeah, water. Thank, you. thank you. Sorry. I'm talking too long, clearly. <laughs> so yeah, so if anything that's um that's too long. Oh, 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 that's yeah, yeah, it's just, um <clears throat> yeah, so so it really just comes down to cost. And uh, and whatever you like. <laughs> so now my, uh, my second question was with the HMOs, because we with the infant, those HMOs can configure themselves in, in very different formations based on what the infant needs. Yes. Do you think that might influence the type of microbes, like especially those one that you said you, you didn't see grow? Yes. Um, do you think maybe a future experiment would be to match the baby breast milk from the mom with the fecal samples from the infant? If that would be we would love to do that. <laughs> so the difficulty is getting the breast milk. Breast milk is very, very um, precious, <laughs> as anyone who's ever breastfed a child would know. Uh, so we're getting our pulled human milk oligosaccharides from the breast milk bank at UC San Diego. And you'll mention, I said, you'll, you'll, you'll um, realize I said pulled. So one of the reasons we use pooled is because each woman's breast milk is different, both at a different time in the child's uh, development, as well as some, some women are secretors, some are non-secretors, and so you have different types of profiles of sugars. And so we're looking at a sort of a pool just to try to uh, take away some of that um, complexity or, or to try and add it in, I suppose, uh, just to try to kind of to limit it. But that's a very good point. So how much does an individual mom's gut micro or, or human milk or, um, oligosaccharide profile influence the type of microbes that, um, that develop in the gut. I don't think anyone really knows. So we're just kind of um, making a start in this direction by kind of really starting to look at or showing that, that all of these different microbes have different effects. And so that actual build of a microbiome very early in life is very much dependent on the exposures that the infant gets in the form of breast milk, formula milk, environmental exposures from the outside. There's many different things. And so this kind of explains why in some infants you have that greater risk for the development of type 1 diabetes and others you don't. Maybe that is kind of driven by, uh, by exposures to things like breast milk. Great talk, thanks. A <laughs> um, bit more of a kind of uh, a broad general question. I, I was wondering if I could get your take on the role of gut microbiota in pathogenesis of obesity. And so if you see dysbiosis in individuals with obesity, is that impacting nutrient extraction from the gut? 
or and or is it kicking out a metabolite of some kind that then is signaling centrally maybe mm -hmm. to influence energy intake and or yeah. energy expenditure like what do you think the relative contributions of, of both of those are yeah so and that's a that's a very open question and i think at first well first of all this idea of dysbiosis is a bit of a tricky one because really we don't have a definition for that and when we look at individuals with obesity compared to individuals without obesity it's very difficult to actually see any difference in diversity even between these two uh, sets uh, because there's just so so much so much diversity between each group so um whether it's I, I think that, that I do think that it has something to do with the amount of energy extraction from from given food um, and, and as well, probably more importantly, it's got something to do with the types of metabolites that these microbes are making in response. So um, we, we're starting to realize and perhaps, perhaps a bit slow, too slowly that um, really when you're talking about a microbiome, it's not what it is that that defines it, but it's what it's doing. And so looking at generally speaking, the small molecule metabolites, because those are the ones that seem to have the most impact on the host and are absorbed so easily. Um, those are the kinds of things that, that we need to be looking at. And that's only just, people are only just starting to do that now. So it's been, you know, people have been looking for a while at what makes an obese microbiome, you know, set up for that particular um, dysbiosis, if you like, and not really been able to find it. But it's only recently that we've started to look at these actual uh, small molecule metabolites. If you want me to bet on it, I would say that what's what the problem here is that we're missing something again, that we're missing a key metabolite that plays some very important role in central metabolism somehow, uh, probably more than one metabolite. <laughs> um, and that, and that, is, that, is, um, that could be missing because we're not eating the right foods, or it could be missing because we've lost a very key, very important, but perhaps very low abundance microbe that is producing um, this type of metabolite. And that's um, one of the reasons that we started to look at the uh, Yanomami peoples because they don't suffer from obesity. They don't, um, they, they don't suffer from a lot of the things that, that plague us. You know, they, they still have a lot of uh, burden of disease, but they're not the kinds of diseases that affect us in the West. So um, yeah, I don't know if I've answered that. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, that was a great talk. Uh, so with David's project, so he's looking at some of the missing microbes and maybe utilizing that as a probiotic yes. therapy. Do you think though that someone who's still eating a westernized diet, those missing microbes are gonna be able to colonize and establish themselves in, in our gut? Right, absolutely not. So one of the things that we often talk about in our lab meetings is that why don't we all just like populate ourselves with what with the animal microbes and that will solve every it'll solve the problem. But that's like a really bad idea <laughs> for lots of reasons. We don't eat a Yanomami diet. And a lot of these microbes, you know, David's hypothesis is that really it's about the types of fiber and the amount of fiber that is consumed in the Yanomami um, uh, society that defines their microbiome. And in fact, that that um Treponema that we've uh, that we've isolated has an enormous number of carbohydrate active enzymes, which shows that it's probably very very good at breaking down these kinds of fibers. And if we were to put that into a Western microbiome, and you didn't and you fed a typical Western diet, you're probably not providing enough fiber. And it's not the only example. There are other microbes in there as well, which are also missing microbes. Very low abundance in uh, in Western in the Western world, or, or not there at all. It's probably the same thing. So this is exactly what we're trying to get to. But the idea is not to make a, I guess, a probiotic. Um, it's, 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 it's too simplistic. Uh, the idea is really to try to understand what it is that these missing microbes do for the host and how important it is to kind of put them back. Do we have to put them back? Because there are some microbes that we actually have in the, in the Western uh, microbiome that we that aren't seen in the animal. So it could just be an adaptation thing. And so just understanding what these microbes might be doing, I think is the first step. Thank you. We have one question on Zoom. I'd love you Hi, I hope that's me. Hi. Yes. Hi, Emma, this is Amy Mangus. Uh, and I wish I was in the room with you so I could give you a hug after the talk because it was hey. amazing. <laughs> it was amazing, amazing, amazing. So I, um, I was really interested in, um, some of the differences that you uh, that you've studied, I, I work on a study with um, um, mothers and infants from Zimbabwe, 
And I also see a difference in the carriage of spirochetes, specifically the treponemes. And I've been struggling um, uh, to, to learn more about these, but of course it's all skewed toward uh, treponema pallidum and some of these other, you know, very um, are kind of archetypal pathogens and very little is known about the, you know, sort of the commensal members of the spirochetes in our guts. And I wondered if you could talk about those in particular, because I, I find them really fascinating and they seem to be observed in many of the studies that you've that you've uh, pointed to and in, again in your study and so any any thoughts about that group in particular yeah so i mean that they are fascinating microbes uh, not just because they look so cool uh, but also because they have quite large genomes uh, in comparison to so treponema pallidum the archetypal pathogen if you like for the treponema world it's actually got an extremely degraded genome very small uh, mostly pseudogenes, um, and it's a, you know it's a typical pathogen. Um, they probably you know they, they share an ancestor clearly, but the, these are, are very very different microbes. And so the treponema that we've found is definitely a a part of the ecosystem. It doesn't seem to be involved in any pathogenic processes. Of course, we've just started looking at it, and but actually actually being able to culture it is the first step to trying to understand what it actually might be doing. And so, um, and so that's what we're doing. So I can't tell you too much because we've really just only just kind of isolated it recently. Um, and just, we're just trying to look at its genome to try to understand what its carbohydrate uh, requirements are and what its other growth <laughs> requirements are. And that's, that's kind of where we are. But, uh, but I would imagine that, um, you know, unfortunately the way that we study microbiology, we tend to think of that, about pathogens more than we do about everything else, but that's just historic, right? Because that's what we started looking at and, um, <clears throat> and certainly in this case, we can't compare the two. They're, they're two very, very different organisms. I would very much doubt that our treponeme um, strain is, um, is pathogenic in any way. Um, and so um, I guess, you know, you can quote me on that. We'll see how things go. But we're not quite there yet for me to be able to sort of say, what does it do? All I can say is that we are starting to understand, um, you know, that, that we can culture it and, and what it might be able to do. That's great. I, I think we might be able to get mag, a mag out of these, so it would be interesting to compare. Okay. Compare. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, any thoughts on looking at the antibiotic resistant genes within the bacteria, the, the, the microbes you're collecting from the animal um, yes. population? Yes, very definitely. So the, one of the major um, um, goals, if you like, of the upcoming Brazilian expedition is to do one of those institutes that's to do that. Uh, so the interesting thing about the Brazilian um, Yadamami diaspora is that they are, uh, they, they, they kind of live across a gradient of um, interaction with the Western world. So you have some Yanomami that live in the city and, you know, they're, they're Westerners and, or not Westerners, but, you know, they're, they're, they're integrated into that community. And then you have others which have never been contacted because you can't, can't get to those because obviously that, that's the definition they have been. Um, but, uh, but you can actually follow this um, gradient as you go down the river, the River Negro. The River Negro. And so that's exactly what uh, the, what David's uh, expedition group are doing. It's part of a larger expedition that's actually being run out of the University of Ghent, actually. And um, and so that and that's the idea. So that we'll be able to sort of see exactly how these ecosystems change and the the more uh, distant they become from the Western world. Now the the one of the things that we want to look at is the antimicrobial resistance carriage, but what we've and what has been looked at so far suggests that it's not that antimicrobial resistance genes don't exist in the microbiome of these people because they do, uh, but it's about the prevalence. And so, um, and remembering as well that one of the reasons that the anomalic people have been contacted is to bring them medical aid, which includes antibiotics. And kind of shockingly, they don't seem to think much about antibiotic stewardship. So they'll give antibiotics out like candy. <laughs> Which is another issue, and so that's uh, that's part of what um, what David wants to look at for sure. Thank you. Good question. I was going to ask about the mucin, so I already answered that for the robogut. Can you also set up different um, transit time to study different motility? And yes. Yeah. Yes, we we haven't done, but we can. 
Um, so we've had to do that, for example, for the for the mouse, and uh, in, and we did actually run a model system of the premature infant gut, which you would think would have a very fast retention time, but actually it's extremely slow. It's the opposite, and that was really running it at the limit of its ability to pump things through at the sort of lowest speed possible. But yes, you can, and um, and yes, you do see different ecosystem profiles as a result of that. It's usually not the species that changes, it's the abundance profiles of the species within them that, that changes in, under those conditions. Yes, here. And just another question um, regarding the DC microbes project. So I understand this is still very early to um, try to implement this um, particular microbe to see in the effect in any kind of condition. Yeah. But is the goal of your lab to like characterize and store these microbes? Is it like a biobank? Yes. As Martin that, that's, a, that, that's one of the things that we want to do for sure, because we, you know, we're, we're lucky we realize that what we've got almost unique access to these things. Um, and so we've set them up in it, we've very carefully set it up to make sure that we are not going to um, obtain any rights that, that, um, uh, that bring money back into the lab. So any, any, um, benefit that is driven that, that, that's come out of this goes through the good projects and other projects that are set up back to the Anamori people. They are there's a you know big bioethics debate about this and I don't want to get into it too much but but one of them is that the, the Anamori people perceive that people are going to the jungle they're sampling them and then they never hear anything more and what are the benefits well we publish papers here in the west but that doesn't help them and so we've had to, there's a lot of work that's being done in the background to make sure that, that we um, derive a benefit that is for the young people. Yeah. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's a very, yeah, we're writing whole ethical uh, papers on this. And actually part of David's PhD thesis is a, it's a whole chapter on the bioethics and how to do this properly. Because, um, you know, the... The way that we think in the West is very alien to the way that the Anamami society think themselves. And because we've got David with one foot in both worlds, it's just a really unique opportunity to, to really delve into this and to see how can we do this for the benefit of everyone. We're lucky to have him. Very <laughs> lucky to have him, yes. And based on your experience, do you, can you speculate in any kind of disease that we have here in the Western um, environment mm -hmm. that you can see these missing microbes being that's it. Well, the yeah, I mean, I can speculate. <laughs> yeah. um, so the Yanomami people, they do not have uh, any, um, and it's been tested and they've been studied for this, they don't have any evidence of heart disease, um, allergies, asthma, um, obesity. They don't, um, uh, they, they're a very happy people. So they don't have uh, any depressive diseases. They don't even have a word for it. They don't understand it when David is trying to talk to them. He doesn't know what language to use because they don't. That's that's very alien to them. Um, and so any and all of those things, um, I think, are, uh, are sort of interesting. And I'm really interested in the gut brain axis idea that there are metabolites that uh, might be produced that might be affecting brain chemistry um, and, uh, and, you know, and so forth. But you also have to think on the flip side of it, it's not a utopia in the jungle. And they actually suffer quite a lot of hardship. They have very low life expectancy. Most of their diseases um, are, um, are infectious in nature and, uh, and also traumatic. So, you know, they'll, they'll go hunting and someone will get shot or with a bow and arrow or something or a tree will fall on them and there's no help. So often they'll die of their, of their injuries. And so it's not a... You know, I'm not sure what I would prefer. When David goes to the jungle, I, I worry. <laughs> yes, uh, nobody knows what he's doing, but, you know, I'm his supervisor, so I have to kind of, we have to put as many safeguards into place as we can. We send him down there with, um, with prophylaxis for malaria, but he tends to just give it to his family um, because that's what he does and that's the way he is. And so um, I've had to try to make sure that he takes enough this time. And there's a malaria vaccine now, so hopefully that will change things. But, um, but yeah, so it's a, it's a very different way of thinking. And it's been a it's been a journey for me as well as uh, well as for David. I think. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Well, first of all, Emma, it's been an amazing talk. I'd be remiss if I didn't make a comment or ask you a question from a former colleague as well. And I look at that picture that you have there, and I go. Maybe that was one of the reasons I came out back to this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I yeah. miss the weather. 
That was a very cold first day yeah. of winter. Yes. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, Gulf Coast is in a big temperature range. Uh, so in the summer, it can be 30, but the relative humidity of God knows what. And then it can be minus 20. Yep. So you go to a 50 degree change from the view and say, oh, oh my God. Yeah. But fortunately, there are good people like them. And David is another part of them. But I was really curious about David's work and the relationship to God. So, you know, Emma, tell me if I'm wrong. I would argue that the the diversity of what we eat is pretty large. Yes. And then I look at the you know, Mami people. So it's really not the diversity. It's really what you eat in that diet. And the other thing that I would say is, and I picked up on this because you made reference to the real makeup. And there's a colleague of ours who is in zoology who studies fish in the real makeup. And I asked him, you know, because they have a, a, a long lifespan. And I said, is that related to the antioxidants that are in? The Rio Negro, because I would argue that probably because it is a dark river, it probably has a lot of phenolics in it. And I'm wondering if there's phenolic uptake by the vegetation around that river that actually aids in, you know, this immunity to autoimmune diseases. And that's so, um, yeah, that's a really good thought. I, I mean. So what I what I do know is that the movement of the Yanomami people to live near the river and become more riparian is a recent thing. Okay. So in the past, they're a semi-nomadic people and they live distant from the river. Okay. And the, it's only recently that they've come to the river as a, cons a consequence of trade. Essentially, they're realizing that they can trade with the Westerners. And so they set up their, their, their homes, their shibonos near the river. So... The, the the Amazon soil itself is really poor, as I think you probably yeah. might appreciate. I mean, it's uh, you'd think that somewhere as biodiverse as the Amazon would have like really rich soil, but it's actually one of the poorest soils on the, on the planet, probably because of all biodiversity. Um, and um, and so they have to move. That's why they're semi nomadic because they set up gardens of plantains. They grow plantains, and then every now and again they have to to move. So I don't know how much antioxidant exposure okay. they have um but interestingly enough that's kind of what uh, his father studied is, is the dietary um inputs for what, what a yanomom eats and going back to your comment on diversity of food so when i first started i was thinking you know very simplistically that we are, you are what you eat right and your microbiome needs to be diverse because it needs to be exposed to a diverse number of substrates but in fact i think it's the opposite and I think that the diversity of food that we're now exposed to means that your diet becomes more and more limited um, in terms of your microbes. You know, if, you, if you're spreading out your dietary um, substrates across many, many different substrates, then microbes that have become very, very accustomed to eating just one or two substrates might be starved out of the equation. And in the, in the Yanomami diet, the case in point, because their diet is fairly varied, they, they eat a lot of stuff from around them, you know, they eat um, fish and whatever game they can catch, but they grow plantains all year round, they eat herons. And if you look at the diversity of substrates that they eat, it's probably far smaller than the diversity of substrates that we eat. And that's a question that I'm trying to sort of get David to kind of take up on, because I think it's a really interesting one. I think part of the problem is that David is only one guy and <laughs> when it's spreading too thin, we will be a bit careful that we don't do too much uh kind of um uh anthropological question stuff um because he's already working on the ethical side of things um but it is something that uh, that i know that the anthropologists that, uh, that are interested in this from Ghent so are, are kind of looking at that as well and i'm saying have you ever used a microbiome as a to track vibration patterns of people Oh, uh, yes. So you can, so there was a study by Van Gaye, it was, came out in, I think, uh, 2019 or 2020. And what they did there, they were trying to prove the missing microbiome hypothesis. And they were showing that um, that first and second generation immigrants from Southeast Asia to the United States very quickly lost their microbiomes uh, once, they, uh, once they hit the United States, essentially. Now, that could be very specifically 
because of the United States and the terrible diet there. Um, maybe that uh, spreads as far north as Canada, I don't know. Um, but there certainly there was there was certainly a big difference between the microbiomes of individuals who were first and second generation immigrants um, compared to when their you know their their, their immigrant um, uh, relatives who just who just arrived, and um, and that was uh, suspected to be because of dietary changes, but uh, and that was also tracked with 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 obesity, which was very very interesting as well. So that's that's the one I'm aware of. I'm sure there are others looking at it, but that's yeah, it's uh, it's a big field. <laughs> yep. What about uh, David's microbiome? David's microbiome <laughs> is very American because so he was actually when he goes there and he stays for you know like uh, yeah. several months, yes. six, twelve. Yes, does it change? So not very much. We have sampled him. Um, as we thought at first that that would be a great way to get the microbes back from the jungle <laughs> in David. Um, but what we saw was that his microbiome, it does, there are elements, there's a little bit of diversity, but, um, but mostly it's just very Western. So diet and lifestyle is not enough. I think, I think that your, your microbiome comes set very early on in your life. And if, you, if it becomes, if it's, um, if it becomes set and it's not particular, particularly diverse, making it more diverse or adding microbes in is an extremely difficult thing to do because your immune system has already set up its tolerance. And so I think that that's, that's what's driving it. So your microbiome tends to stay very, I mean, I don't know, I wouldn't say completely because it could be that if David went down to live in the jungle for the rest of his life, then things might change with time and pressure, but I don't think we really understand quite how long that needs to be and how, how much of an exposure you need to have. But he does get terrible diarrhea. He, he, he's quite, uh, he's quite open about it. <laughs> he said he ate, uh, the worst thing he ever ate was some um, armadillo and it made him very sick for days um, and uh, doesn't know why. And I said, oh, gosh, I want to do that, but there you go. But it, he, it could be, yeah. it could be. But, um, and uh, your infant is studying. Mm -hmm. Have you looked if this infant comes from natural birth, birth or uh, sequence? Yeah, so that, that is known. We haven't, we haven't really looked at it in the context of what we were trying to do because we we're only looking at a very small subset of infants and we were asking a different question. But the dive immune cohort itself, that was one of the things that was being asked. And so the dive immune cohort has been drawn from three countries across the same geographic area, <clears throat> Finland, Russian Korea, and somewhere else that will come to me in a minute. Um, and so they're very ethnically the same, but they have very different diet and lifestyle factors. And so that was why it was chosen. That's why they were chosen to come from there. So yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Any other question on Zoom? And lost most people out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.